Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily. I'm Nicholas Richardson and this is the news. Seven people have been arrested and three policemen have been killed during a raid on a house in Colombo, following a number of bomb attacks on churches and hotels in Sri Lanka. The death toll from the attacks at three churches and four hotels has risen to more than 250, with over 400 injured. Addressing crowds in St. Peter's Square in Rome, gathered to hear his traditional Easter Sunday Urbi et Orbi greeting to Rome and to the world, the Pope condemned the attacks. The Easter Sunday bomb blast at three churches and four hotels in Sri Lanka killed more than 200 people and wounded at least 450, police officials said. This was the first major attack on the Indian Ocean Islands since the end of a civil war 10 years ago. The government declared a curfew in Colombo and blocked access to social media and messaging sites, including Facebook and WhatsApp. It was unclear when the curfew would be lifted. There were no immediate claims of responsibility for the attacks. The head of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, expressed his support for the victims of the attack. I wish to express my affectionate closeness to the Christian community, hit while it was covered in prayer, and to all the victims of such cruel violence. The local authorities will be investigating the matter further. Catholics around the world celebrated Easter today. Easter, which celebrates Christ's resurrection, is the most important holiday in the church's calendar and is celebrated with particular devotion in Poland, where some 90% of the population are declared Catholics. As well as a religious observance, Easter is a time for families and friends to get together, to eat a traditional breakfast with some food blessed by the priest and enjoy a peaceful weekend with their closest relatives. Jesus Christ has risen and is with us. He's showing us the light of his resurrection and he does not forsake the ones who are suffering the difficult circumstances, pain and mourning. Easter leads us to take a look at the Middle East, torn apart by the incessant divisions and political tension. Let the Christians of this region continue to be patient and experience the risen Lord and the victory of life over death. May the resurrected Christ, who opened the gate of his tomb wide open, open our hearts to the needs of the ones suffering poverty, who are helpless, redundant and outcast, people who knock on our doors looking for bread, shelter and acknowledgement of their dignity. The ceremony of the Day of Resurrection started in the early morning with holy masses and resurrection processions. Easter Day is the first and the most important holiday in the Catholic Church. The Apostles and the first Christians originally celebrated only Easter Eve and Easter Sunday as a reminder of the Paschal night. It was only over time that the current liturgical calendar was created. The second round of the presidential elections in Ukraine started today. The cousin president, Pietro Poroshenko is facing a challenge from Volodymyr Zelensky, who, apart from his political career, is also an actor and a comedian. Zelensky, who played a fictitious president of Ukraine in a popular television series, Servant of the People, won the first round of the elections by a significant margin. He is predicted to win the second round too, a case of life imitating art. Sick children can now experience the animals in Poznan Zoo from their hospital beds with the help of Leosh, a robot volunteer who rolls through the zoo, showing the live stream of the inhabitants. Leos was conceived by Polish animal lover Łukasz Bodnarowski, whose son Boris was diagnosed with a genetic muscle-wasting disease a year ago. Bodnarowski said he considered quitting his job running a foundation working with wild bears to care for Boris. However, his son, who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, begged him not to give up his work with the foundation. A year ago, I found out that my son was sick with Duchenne's dystrophy. I had the opportunity or the misfortune to spend time in Spanish hospital wards amongst sick children, many of whom are practically bedridden. Leos, named after Leo Messi, Boris's favorite footballer, is controlled by a computer or mobile device and accompanied by a zookeeper or volunteer who explains facts about the animals to the child 
controlling him. He can also access areas of the zoo which are generally off limits to visitors, allowing the children to experience zoo life from behind the scenes. Using a computer, we can connect with Laos. We connect with Laos, and thanks to that, we can walk around the zoo, we can visit it, we can watch the elephants as if it were alive. So the children are happy, especially when they get to see a big trunk next to the camera. Laos has been warmly received by staff and patients at the Victor Dega Clinical Hospital in Poznan, who have been testing the device for the past two months. Bonnarowski's Don Vittorio Foundation for Wild Animals plans to purchase 20 more robots and to expand cooperation with other hospitals and zoos as well as other attractions. Donning yellow trousers, shiny platform shoes, red lipstick and headphones, eight-year-old DJ Vika stands behind the decks mixing party music in a huge Warsaw club. Instead of babysitting grandchildren, Poland's oldest DJ, Virginia Schmidt, packs her CDs, mixer and laptop and heads off to spin for a packed dance floor of mainly senior citizens. DJ Vika said she does not care whether people like the fact that she dances while at the decks or not because she cannot play and stand still. I don't care whether people do or don't like that I'm moving and dancing because I cannot play and stay still. I cannot play and stay still because this melody is in me. I test the melody on me. When I play, I feel this melody, I feel this rhythm. And I simply, if I was a young DJ, I would do woo 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 and I would be running around the stage with a microphone and entertaining everyone. Aware of the rejuvenating quality of music for the mind and body, the self-trained Vika has been DJing for Polish retirees for two decades, earning widespread respect in the business. By being surrounded by music, I still keep my brain going. I am learning all the time. I am learning new rhythms. I am surrounded by people who are happy with their lives. They are free of stereotypes. Vika, a former special education teacher, said that she doesn't see why her age should determine how she lives her life, saying that she does not fit the stereotypes of elderly people. I don't see a reason why my age should determine my life norms. Normal life to me is to feel joy in my life for as long as I can. Every Monday night she entertains about 1,000 people at the Hula Kula Club, smashing stereotypes and empowering seniors as she plays everything from disco and rock to samba and ballads. That's it from the news. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for The Weather and Poland Daily Business and other programs. But from me, it's have a good night and a better tomorrow. I'm Aleksandra Zarzycka and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's see the forecast for tonight. A quite overcast night as large parts of the country. A maximum 6 degrees and a minimum 4 degrees on the northeast and in central Poland. Now over to tomorrow. It will be a sunny day. The most sunlight will appear around Szczecin. The temperature will range from 16 degrees in Białystok and Lublin to 19 in Zielona Góra. Let's see the forecast for the following three days. On Tuesday, temperature will range from 18 to 19 degrees. On Wednesday, we will see higher temperature across the Poland, about 19 and 22 degrees. Rainfall will appear on the south. On Thursday, temperature will rise to 23 degrees on the west and 24 degrees in central Poland. Thank you for watching and goodbye. meeting with Mr. Krzysztof Stalewski of Hello. Legia Warszawa. Uh, sir, thank you very much for coming to our studio. Thank you for inviting me here. Hello, everyone. Okay, well, if you are being asked what is Legia, what do you say? Legia was, uh, is the most popular club in Poland, in sports club, and we're 
mainly known thanks to our football team and I assume that most of the people in Poland know Legia thanks to our football club but we have also other teams such as volleyball, basketball team and swimming teams and one of them is Legia Esports which is a new thing, pretty new and we see that it has a huge potential and that's why we are in it. Let's go a little bit into details. What sort of sections, what sort of, uh, what can you train in a Legia e sport team? So, so far we have just one team. It's Legia Esports FIFA team. We have two players, two professional FIFA players. One of them is the Polish champion. He has just won the Polish championship. Actually, it happened here in Katowice a few days ago. And so, as we are a football club and we wanted to enter esports, we wanted to do something which will have link between our sports team and our new esports team. So that's why we decided to have a FIFA team because it's pretty similar to football. So our fans can understand it. And there is a huge link between our football team and our, let's say, digital football team. Okay, so, so that's what why it we takes have... to become a, a FIFA professional uh, player. Well, so, of course, you need to play a lot, and I mean, like, really a lot, but it's not only that. Of course, you need to play against other players uh, very often, especially if you can with the top players from the world or Europe, and we think that it helps, and I'm pretty sure that we're correct, if you also do other things to and uh, to get your level higher. So that's why we also organize for our football, for our esports players boot camps, which are kind of like training camps. They play FIFA, but not only, they also meet with our coach. So they go to the gym and they need to work out. They meet with our psychologists so they can talk about their problems, what they feel when they're playing. So this small details I think make later a huge difference during the games and I think that in the final when Milos won uh, against the player whose name Rip Torek, his nickname is Rip Torek, I think the moment when there was a moment when he was winning 2-0 then after first half then it went into 2-3 and I think thanks to those talkings to our psychologists and those trainings, he was still able to concentrate and to focus and not to give up. And that's why he won finally for free. So the sports is about not giving up, about failure exactly. and overcoming that. So this works also in this e-sport. What is the age of your uh, sportsman? Uh, one of them is 24 and the other is 22. Okay. Um, the champion is 24. So the those are like yeah. kids who spend their childhood in front of the computers, which is not an ideal for many parents. Mm -hmm. That's true, and that's why I think it's a good solution to to get to talk to with your kids and tell them that okay you can play and I understand it but you need to do something extra because this is what professional esports players do they really need to work out because they need to concentrate for many hours I think it's pretty similar to goalkeepers like when you're a goalkeeper you actually don't need to be super fit right yeah, you don't but run you don't lot. run but to be concentrated for the 90 minutes I think this is what helps you, that when you're fit and you work out with the other players, it helps you to concentrate for the whole game. And even when you don't have too many situations during the game and there's just this one where you need to take it, you need to block it, then you do it because you know how to concentrate. Uh, it's nothing that new. The ancient Greeks had this unity between mind and body. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. By exercising your body, you also yeah. exercising your mind. The same works for esports, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Krzysztof Stalewski, um, manager of the e.
sport at Legia Warszawa uh, football club. Fantastic club, it's huge history, 102 years right now. Uh, so, yes, sir, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very nice talking studio. to you. And uh, if you happen to ha know someone who spends too many times, too many hours in front of the computer, please contact him with Krzysztof and uh, maybe his career will develop in the eSport uh, um, area. That's it for a business uh, edition. Still, uh, please stay with us and watch us next time. I'm Alexandra Zarzycka and welcome back to Poland Daily Weather. Let's see the forecast for tomorrow. It will be a sunny day, the most sunlight will appear around Szczecin. The temperature will range from 16 degrees in Białystok and Lublin to 19 in Zielona Góra. Let's take a look at tomorrow's forecast for our continent. Rainy weather in Eastern Europe, 17 degrees in Oslo and 17 in Helsinki. Colder temperature in Northern Eastern Europe with 13 degrees in Kiev and 15 in Helsinki. Higher temperature will appear in Paris and London, 24 degrees. Thank you for watching and goodbye. Welcome to Poland Daily Culture. Today we will be going back to the 16th century and we will see the museum of Jan Kochanowski. My guest today will be Mrs. Maria Jaskot. Hello and welcome to Poland Daily Culture. Let's start with the first question. When the museum was opened? The museum was opened on 16 Września 1961. The museum was opened on September 16, 1961. An outstanding art historian and expert on Jan Kochanowski's life and art, Julian Krzyżanowski, gave a keynote speech on museum's activity. Happily, there is still a radio recording of this professor's speech. Actually, there is an anecdote connected with the opening of the museum. Thanks to this, we know that a famous Polish poet, Jarosław Iwaszkiewicz, and a little less known nowadays Polish prose writer, Jan Maria Gizges, connected to the Silesian Wojewodaship, were both present at the museum's opening. Gizges wrote an epigram about his trip to Czarnolesie. The epigram says, Unfortunately, no one paid attention to the two humble poets there. The first modest exhibition was created in 1961, during a difficult period after war. It wasn't that easy to organize such a thing. Local activists were doing their best. They were engaged in many associations, but also Świętokrzyskie Museum became a patron of the idea of establishing of the Czernoleski Museum. The very first exhibition was prepared by a worker of the Świętokrzyskie Museum in Kielce, Aleksandra Dobrowolska. She organized three important biographical museums in Poland, Jan Kochanowski Museum, Stefan Żeromski School Years Museum in Kielce and the Museum of Henryk Sienkiewicz in Oblęgorg. As I mentioned before, the exhibition was very modest because there were not enough money for this undertaking. And that's why these four modest rooms were equipped with blackboards showing Jan Kochanowski's life and art. The situation changed in the 80s, when Czarnolas and the entire environment of the Polish men of letters were preparing to the two important anniversaries. One of them was the 400th anniversary of Kochanowski's death, and the other, 450th anniversary of his birth. Comprehensive revitalization works were carried out at the time. Also, the new scenario of the biographical exhibition was prepared. A chapel, which lost its sacred character for some time and was used as a room for variable exhibitions, was also renovated. Last year, we modernized these exhibitions from the 80s and we introduced new biographical texts related to Kochanowski. 
We placed Kohanovsky's most important work of his entire output, David's Psalter, in the chapel. The exhibition is also expanded to include context related to Czarnolas, where we can get to know Kohanovsky as the owner of Czarnolesie, as the protector of those goods, and the man who is the poet, the nobleman, and the landlord of this place. Jan Kochanowski was a Polish Renaissance poet who established poetic patterns that would become integral to the Polish literary language. He is commonly regarded as the greatest Polish poet before Adam Mickiewicz and the greatest Slavic poet prior to the 19th century. Kochanowski was born at Sycyna near Radom, Poland. Little is known of his early education. At 14, fluent in Latin, he was sent to the Kraków Academy. After graduating in 1547, at age 17, he attended the University of Königsberg in Ducal Prussia and Padua University in Italy. At Padua, Kochanowski came in contact with the great humanist scholar Francesco Robotello. Kochanowski closed his 15-year period of studies and travels with a final visit to France, where he met the poet Pierre Ronsard. In 1559, Kochanowski returned to Poland for good, where he remained active as a humanist and Renaissance poet. He spent the next 15 years close to the court of King Sigismund II Augustus, serving for a time as royal secretary. Kochanowski settled on a family estate at Czarnolas, Blackwood, to lead the life of a country squire. In 1575, he married Dorota Podlodowska, with whom he had seven children. Kochanowski is sometimes referred to in Polish as Jan z Czarnolasu, John of Blackwood. It was there that he wrote his most memorable works, including the dismissal of the Greek envoys and the laments. Kochanowski died, probably of a heart attack, in Lublin on August 22, 1584. Was this his family's possession? Yes, Czarnolas was in the Kochanowski family possession. The poet's grandfather, also named Jan, got it. Then he gave this to the poet's father, Piotr Kochanowski. And after that, as a result of divisions of this property, half of it was given to Jan Kochanowski. Of course, he didn't start to manage this property immediately, because he was relatively very young, he was 29 at the time. He just came back from the University of Padua, which lasted about five years. He was looking around for some patronage. That is, he wanted to be a writer, just like Pierre de Ronsard in Paris or Ariosto Ferreira. He wanted to work close to the king. He knew he would develop under king's patronage. Aby przy królu, będąc pod jego mecenasem, właśnie mógł rozwijać swoją twórczość. And he succeeded. I to mu się poniekąd udało, może bezpośrednio pod jakby skrzydła królewskie nie trafił. Yes, to a certain extent. He didn't get the king's patronage directly, but he got an amazing bishop's patronage. And I think that nothing better could happen to him at that time. Firstly, his friendship with the bishop of Płock, then with the Krakow's patron of poets, an outstanding humanist, who studied at the University of Padua, just like Kohanowski, who later invited Kohanowski to his smaller chancellery located in Wawel. At that time, the matter of signing of the Polish-Lithuanian Union was ongoing, which is why Kohanowski was very busy with his duties as a secretary. He also took part in various trips with Piotr Myszkowski and the king, during which he was helping with his writing skills. Myszkowski put a great amount of merits on Kohanowski, in the sense that he gave up his lucrative position at the Archdiocese of the Grand Duchy of Posen, and Jan Kohanowski took over his position in the Poznań parish. Kohanowski made lower priestly vows. That's why he couldn't leave the Holy Mass but a priest who was at the same parish was doing it on his behalf. The same priest was also a parish priest in Zvolen. It was a very modest parish and didn't bring Kochanowski any income. 
But Kohanovsky earned a lot of money thanks to his artwork, especially the David's Psalter, which was very popular. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. We are here at the city of Lublin, one of the most historical and largest cities of all of Eastern Poland. Today, we are going to the Catholic University of Lublin, a bastion of the anti-communist movement during the time when Poland is in the grip of the Soviet Union. It was also the home to Karol Wojtyla, who would later on become Pope John Paul II. There, we will talk to a historian who specializes in 20th century history. In 1939, when World War II erupts, uh, Lublin is hit as hard as all the rest of the Poland. And I was wondering if you can elaborate on how it looks like here in Lublin, especially when it comes to the German occupation and a little bit afterwards in 1944 during the Russian occupation. Mm. W czasie II wojny światowej e, Lublin był okupowany wyłącznie przez Niemców. Armia Czerwona... During the Second World War, Lublin was occupied only by the Germans. The Red Army didn't reach Lublin in 1939. However, Lublin suffered a lot from the very beginning, because Polish units from the west, be it from the Warsaw or Krakow areas, withdrew to the east through Lublin. Because of this, Lublin began being bombed from September 5, 1939. Factories as well as residential homes were bombarded. Among others, what we call the old city was heavily bombarded. As a result, civilians were killed here from the beginning. When the Germans took Lublin, persecution of the civilian population began immediately. Two groups suffered the most to begin with. That was the Polish intelligentsia, which already began to be executed in September 1939, and the Jewish population. By the end of 1939, the Germans marked local Jews with stars, as they did in the whole of Poland, and created a local ghetto. They closed off part of the town, surrounded it with barbed wire, cutting it off from the rest of the town, and shoved the Jewish population in there, while at the same time executing specifically chosen Jews from time to time. Lublin and the Lublin Voivodeship was an extremely important part of the German plans. At that time, Hitler and those surrounding him didn't know what to do with the Jews. At the end of 1939, they came up with a plan to create a settlement zone for Jews in the Lublin Voivodeship, a type of great Jewish reservation. They wanted to create it in the area to the east of Lublin, where Jews from all of occupied Europe were to be brought, and there, as a result of illness, malnourishment and and hard work, they were to die. But this plan did not come to fruition, and from the end of 1941 and the beginning of 1942, a different plan was implemented, a plan to exterminate the Jews. The headquarters of Operation Reinhardt, the operation to kill all Polish Jews, was here in Lublin. The main architect of the final solution, Odilo Globocznik, also resided in Lublin. The Polish population was persecuted in a more selective manner. In 1940, under the AB action, the operation to eliminate Polish intelligentsia, the first thousand Polish intellectuals were shot at Rurie in Lublin and in many other parts of the town. So the Holocaust is one of the more devastating events that was permeated throughout Europe, especially Poland. And especially in the Lublin region, we are close to the, one of the death camps known as Majdanek. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the Holocaust and how it looked like specifically in this region. Majdanek nie był obok Lublina. Majdanek to był obóz zbudowany w Lublin. 
Majdanek wasn't next to Lublin. It was a camp built in Lublin. It's a part of the town. So we have a situation where we have a factory of death right beside the houses of Lublin residents. It is hard to imagine, but that is exactly how it looked. Majdanek was the smallest of the death camps built by Odilo Globocznik in the Lublin Wojewodship. Sobibur and Bełżec, both 100 kilometers away from Lublin, were far more important and far bigger factories of death. Around 80,000 people died in Majdanek, so relatively little. Two-thirds were Jews, one-third were Poles and Soviet prisoners of war. Whereas the powerful factories of death like Sobibur and Belzec each had 300 to 350,000 people die in them. These 350,000 people were murdered in under a year, and the average lifespan of a person in such a factory, from the point of arrival, was around two hours. People were killed within two Two hours at the rate of around 5,000 per day. It was a horrific and cruel experience, and Lublin played the role of kind of an organizational base for this enormous crime. It's from Lublin that the Germans managed the factories of death and gathered together the assets taken from the Jews. This is where they sorted what they took and sent it off either to the German army or the Third Reich. At the same time, the Germans planned for the Lublin Voivod ship to be the first bus of Germanness in the East. That is why at the end of 1942, and it's something they developed further in 1943, they began to deport the population of Zamoszczyzna. In the space of a couple of months, over 100,000 Poles were deported and replaced with 23,000 German settlers who were given the land and assets taken from the Poles. As a result, in this area around Zamość and Zamoszczyzna, there was a great partisan war where the Poles underground opposed the Germans, the German settlement lords. This ultimately led to the suspension of settlement action. During the Second World War, the Germans used force to deport more than 100,000 Poles from the Lublin region in order to conduct its first attempt of colonizing an area in the Central Eastern Europe. Around 50,000 of the Poles were sent to forced labor camps in Germany. Next up, we will ask Professor Vnuk about the revenge actions of the Polish underground and the spiral of violence in eastern Poland. So we know that the Germans wanted to establish like a little German state here in the Lublin region. And I was wondering how did the Polish partisan wage war against them and were there other victims, did the violence spread, how did it affect the whole region and its people? First and foremost, we must return to the Ostplan, the German plan for the East, the German settlement plan. German planners believed the entire area in the East, from the pre-war German border up to the Ural Mountains, should be a German area. They planned that within 30 years, through work, through the sterilization of women and men, by simply cutting these people out within 30 or 60 years tops. Slavs would no longer be around in the whole of Eastern Europe. The first area where this was attempted, as I already said, was Zamuszczyzna, and this is where the first German settlers were placed. Poland's response was to oppose these settlers, an operation aimed against armed Germans and also the civil population. So a spiral of murder and hatred began. At the same time, in 1943, the Ukrainian population living in Volynia, in Galicia and the east of the Lublin Voivodship began to be organized by Ukrainian nationalists who wanted to build their own state and the first big military operation aimed at the Polish population was the ethnic cleansing in Volynia, which at the end of 1943 and the beginning of 1944 spilled over into the Lublin Voivodship. So the east of the Lublin Voivodship became a battlefield, a place of murder, a free-for-all. Poles killed Germans, Poles were killed by Germans and Ukrainians, Poles killed Ukrainians. It was a horrific time and the Lublin Voivodship became hell on earth. Był to, był to straszliwy czas, a Lubelszczyzna stała się swego rodzaju 
piekłem na ziemi. We know that there's a German concentration camp here at the city of Lublin, but then in 1944, when the Soviets roll into Lublin, how, how did the Germans react to it? Like, how did, did they do anything to cover up their crimes, or did they just let it sit there? Jeśli chodzi o dwa te najważniejsze obozy śmierci, czyli Sobibur i Bełżec. When it comes to the two most important death camps, Sobibur and Bełżec, at the end of 1943, when the European Jewish population had practically been killed off, the camps stopped being important, so the Germans went ahead with an operation to extract the bodies which had not been burned, then burning and grinding them up before burying them. It was a special operation to hide their crimes. This happened in Bełżec and Treblinka. The camps were completely abolished, plowed and and given to local farmers as farmlands. In the case of Bełżec, it was a Ukrainian farmer. In the case of Sobibur, a forest was planted in order to completely hide what had happened. Lublin was freed so quickly, the Soviet offensive was so fast that they didn't have time to hide the evidence of the crimes there. So when Majdanek was emancipated, all the barracks stood still and for the first time Soviet soldiers saw what a concentration camp was. The Germans, of course, tried to kill off all the prisoners up until the last moment. Because they could not burn the bodies in crematories fast enough, they burnt them in the open air. A similar operation was conducted against mainly Polish prisoners at the castle in Lublin, where, because they couldn't hide their crimes, they just murdered all the prisoners in their cells the day before their withdrawal. They closed the cells and fled. The bodies lay there for three hot July days. If I remember correctly, around 800 prisoners were killed in this way in Majdanek. The horror of the German occupation lasted until practically the last day the Germans were present on this land. As we have seen today, Lublin has a very long, yet at times dramatic history. But places such as the Catholic University of Lublin sufficiently demonstrated the city spirit and their love for freedom. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History. Okay, so we're down by the river now, and welcome back to Poland Daily. I said we were going to come down, and you can see it's a beautiful day out here. It's uh, really, really pleasant, and spring is officially, is officially here, and it's a great place to be, one of the most beautiful places in the country on the warmest day so far of the year. But anyway, I wanted to continue about uh, talking about artists, at least briefly. It was uh, well known that at the end of the 18th century, artists started to come here. Many of those painters uh, are, are well-known names within the Polish uh, pantheon of painters. You had Vogel and Richter and Piwarski and Gerson and Pankiewicz, for an example. Um, then you had a series of Impressionists who painted pictures here too, like Gier, uh, Mins, Gierim, ah. Jarimski. <laughs> there I said it. So you had a series of impressions like, uh, like uh, Jarimski. Um, the true age of art, though, in Kazimierz did not really start until the, the beginning of the 20th century. As we said, the same time as the art movement was beginning in uh, Zakopane with the Zakopane style. This is this very rustic rural style. And that was somewhat what was going on here, too, just with a little more accent uh, on, on painting, I, uh, you might say, than, uh, and sculpture and those sort of things, than on, uh, and, and, and writing, than on folklore, particularly, uh, which is really the thing in, uh, in, in Zakopane, the Zakopane style. Um, but the, uh, you could say that uh, uh, the uh, Warsaw School of Arts uh, was established, and uh, when that happened, they began to look for a place to paint, an inspiring place, a place uh, that would be far enough out in the country but still close to Warsaw 
and create a totally different environment for the painter to immerse himself in. And that was Kazimierz Dolny. It became a, a place where you had a lot of uh, experienced artists coming uh, to work. How was it a colony? Uh, was it an artist colony? It's hard to say. Um, we can look at uh, uh, Rainier Maria Rilke's quote. He said that uh, uh, only only uh, life uh, only life can take shape uh, uh, when you have a lifestyle, when you create when art is your lifestyle. Um, so. I guess that's what they were trying to create, uh, was, was their own lifestyle. Uh, and Kazimierz was the uh, perfect place for finding honesty and a, a sort of primitive uh, setting. And I, I think if you, look, if you look behind me now and you see the, the nice broad river here and the, the wide river banks and the hills on either side, I mean, it does seem to enclose one in a, a feeling of, uh, 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 of, of being surrounded by nature, I think. And that's always good for an artist. At least it was back then. Um, the art colony, uh, of course, was, in, uh, was growing under the uh, tutelage of uh, Mr. Proshinsky. And uh, we can say that uh, he, uh, he continued uh, to uh, make to expand the view that this was a haven for artists um, throughout this time. Um, he had a number of friends who came here, Jan Zamoyski and Antoni Mihalik and Jan Vidra, and many artists from, from different Polish cities um, representing uh, uh, you know, different styles were following the, the Pruszkowski school, if you, if, if you like. Um, so he was a big figure. And they would come to Kazimierz Dolny and have these uh, sort of... Uh, you know, uh, get-togethers, these plein airs. Um, and uh, uh, there was no, uh, you know, they weren't like the Surrealists, for example, who had a particular artistic uh, manifesto. That, that wasn't the case. They were, um, uh, they were a bit more anar anarchistic. At least individual ideas uh, were, were welcome. There was no uh, need to adhere to one particular thing other than inspiration. Inspiration was the thing. Pruszkowski, as we know, built the, the large house on the hill, which is a fascinating place. And uh, Mihalik, uh, Antoni Mihalik was here as well as one of his, one of his students. And they must have, uh, they must have found uh, a huge inspiration here. But remember, this is the interwar period. Poland has just, I mean, it's a, it's a boom in creativity because Poland has just become a country again. It's been a long time. 130 years or something since Poland was a country, so uh, because of the partitions, and this is leading up, of course, to the tragedy, destruction, total just, uh, destruction of of personality of Poland under the German and then Russian occupa occupation. I mean, uh, perhaps that's too strong to say the personality was destroyed because it stayed alive in people's minds, it's particularly artists. But it was a real fight to to keep that, and certainly the country. Um, uh, was uh, freedom of thought was not a uh, priority under Germans or Russians. We can safely say that, I think, folks. Anyway, we can say that art and artists have, have really uh, uh, shaped the nature of Kazimierz Stolny. And this goes back to the old days when, and, and its origins when, when trade uh, created, uh, you know, sculpture like those fine buildings we've seen, created the money, the opulence, to, uh, to uh, embellish architecture, we can say. And this led to the growth of handicrafts and, and, and this sort of thing, and then eventually to fine art, to the growth of fine art here. And it's, in some sense, it started as an absolutely a business town, and it's become an arts town. Uh, 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 it, it, it's quite extraordinary, and a, a great tourist destination. I mean, you can't go wrong. If you come here, you're going to like it. Uh, especially if you come from a country like the United States, uh, uh, Australia, some of these places, newer countries where you don't have medieval is just non-existent. At any rate, we said before uh, what happened uh, during World War II to Mr. Pruszkowski, and I don't think it's need, there's any need to address that except that that is extremely sad considering how great a figure he was in promoting not only... Uh, this uh, particular place, Kazimierz Dolny, but also 
home country, the one in which we're standing, Poland. This is Poland Daily. Stay with us. We're going on for more exciting stuff. We're in Kazimierz Dolny, and boy, it's a beautiful day.